delighted to welcome uh, Michael Bratton. Michael Bratton is Professor of Political Science and African Studies at Michigan State University. He's the founder of the Afro Barometer that is used to measure democracy indicators in African states. He is the author of four books, the most uh, recent being Public Opinion, Democracy and Markets in Africa. He has published well over 60 articles. He teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in comparative and African politics at uh, Michigan State University. So please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Professor Michael Bratton. Thanks very much uh, to Muna Ndulo for inviting me and to Evangeline Ray for making all the arrangements. And thank you all for coming, for giving up your lunch hour to hear a talk about transitional justice in Zimbabwe. Everyone, I'm sure, is familiar with the location of Zimbabwe, a country of somewhere between 10 and 12 million people. We don't know how many because there's, there's been massive out-migration in recent years. Um, bordered on the south by South Africa and Botswana to the north by, um, by, by Zambia. The map here shows uh, the main provinces in Zimbabwe, and I'm going to make particular mention of two provinces in the south, um, Matabililand North and Matabililand South. Um, in many ways, the, this region is distinctive, both agroecologically and culturally, and ultimately politically. And if there is a line of political cleavage in Zimbabwe, it probably runs along that border between Matabeleland and the rest of the country. As a way of getting into the subject of transitional justice, perhaps you'd like to read these two quotations. They come from focus group discussions among women in Matabeleland North that were conducted by the Mass Public Opinion Institute in July 2009. And what these two quotations show is that people can have quite different points of view about what to do in the face of political violence. On the one hand, Alice, as we've called her, feels that perpetrators of political violence should be made to stand public trial whereas Beatrice feels that it would perhaps be better for the country and for the community to forget about what happened in the past and to move on. The research questions that I'm interested in are under conditions of state-sponsored violence, do people prefer to reveal the truth about human rights abuses or forget what happened in the past? More particularly, do they wish to hold perpetrators of violence to account or provide them with amnesty? And finally, what explains any popular willingness that we might find to consider a strong or retributive form of transitional justice? Let's say a word or two about transitional justice. Understood as a sense of fairness, I think we can recognize that justice is foundational to any kind of social organization. Transitional justice refers to the um, provision of justice under particular political circumstances, the circumstances of a transition from one form of regime to another, usually a, a transition from authoritarian uh, rule. In fact, a literature on the subject of transitional justice has arisen to uh, try and systematize our understanding um, of knowledge and practice about protecting human rights under transitional uh, circumstances. It deals with a set of measures such as revealing the truth about atrocities, prosecuting abusers in the courts of law, reforming security sector agencies, and compensating and memorializing victims. Transitional justice focuses on specific illegal acts, in particular murder, abduction, 
and torture committed by political agents, that is either agents of the state or of political parties, or of organized militia groups. With regard to um, what Huntington calls the torturer problem, he asks whether the appropriate course is to persecute, uh, excuse me, prosecute and punish, or to forgive and forget. My argument is that if we really want to answer that question, we have to pay attention to power politics. In the real world, where authoritarian resilience is just as um, common as the installation of democracy, the prospects for transitional justice are powerfully shaped by politics. In other words, the distribution of power between incumbent and emergent elites during the transition period has a large impact on whether abusers can be held to account. If officials of strong authoritarian regimes engineer their own exit from power, they can usually arrange legal immunity and thus evade responsibility, as General Pinochet did for many years in Chile. By contrast, the authoritarians whose collapsing regimes are summarily displaced by a popular uprising may suddenly find themselves facing persecution, uh, prosecution in a court of law. I think you all saw those images of Hosni Mubarak a few weeks ago uh, when he was first um, put on trial. Finally, in cases where regime transition is a gradual process of negotiation, equally matched adversaries often arrive at conciliatory solutions in which non-retributive forms of justice, such as a truth commission, a program for national healing, or compensation for victims, are substituted for prosecution and punishment. And of course, South Africa stands out as um, a good example of this approach. I'm particularly interested in what ordinary people want from um, transitional justice. As a public opinion researcher, we saw an opportunity in Zimbabwe to try and discern uh, what popular preferences uh, were. So far, the study of attitudes towards transitional justice has focused mainly on elites, but there have been a few path-breaking micro-studies such as the work of uh, Jim Gibson in South Africa and Timothy Longman in Rwanda. But these studies share what I describe here as a retrospective perspective. That is, they look back after the Truth Commission or after the trials of abusers and ask, were these transitional justice solutions acceptable or not? It seems to me what we need, rather, and have an opportunity to look at in Zimbabwe, is a set of prospective questions. That is, while the transition is underway, and before the, the issues have been resolved or set in stone in some way, to ask people what they would prefer in terms of how to handle the so-called uh, torturer problem. And I want to make just one further distinction about the type of justice that people might want, and that's the common distinction from the literature in this field between retributive and restorative justice. This is the distinction between putting abusers on trial and punishing them by, by means of the law, as opposed to putting the focus on the victim and finding ways either to make apologies or provide compensation uh, for the wrongs that have been done to them. Why Zimbabwe? Well, it's a country that, is, that has had a long history of uh, political violence. If you go back into the colonial period, you realize that the occupation by the white settlers in the last decade of the 19th century was 
effected by, by force of arms, that the alienation of land uh, was done in a brutal and harsh manner, and that in fact the state that was established in Zimbabwe was a particularly strong and repressive state um, under the white settler regime, led in the end by Ian Smith, who broke away from uh, British rule in a unilateral declaration of independence. In reaction to those events, Zimbabwe went through a 15-year liberation war in the period 1966 to 1979, in which both sides, both the guerrillas of the of ZANU and ZAPU, the two liberation movements, um, the Zimbabwe African National Union, Zimbabwe African People's Union, both on their side and on the side of Ian Smith's Rhodesian security forces. But what I want to focus on here, without forgetting that there is a history to political violence in Zimbabwe, is what happens in the post-colonial period, the period since 1980 when the government has been controlled by Robert Mugabe's party, now named the Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, ZANU uh, PF. In the first decade of independence, ZANU PF turned upon ZAPU in the southwest part of the country, in Matabeleland, in, in a campaign of systematic violence known as Gukuruhundi. Gukuruhundi is a, a, a Shona term, meaning the wind that blows away the chaff from the seeds at the beginning of the planting season. And what it referred to was Mugabe's use of a North Korean trained 5th Brigade who went into Matabili land ostensibly to eliminate dissident forces aligned with ZAPU, but in fact engaged in what many believe, certainly in Matabili land they believe, was a genocide. According to the Catholic Commission for Justice and Peace in Zimbabwe, at least 20,000 people were killed, often after being tortured and with their bodies summarily thrown down mine shafts. A second episode of violence under ZANU PF were the land invasions that began in 2000. We have to understand that by this time, 20 years after independence, as a result of the mismanagement of the economy, an opposition movement had arisen, the Movement for Democratic Change, MDC, that had actually handed ZANU-PF its first defeat at the polls. There was a constitutional referendum in 2000 in which ZANU-PF was unable to get through because of a no vote, it's preferred revisions to the Constitution. A Constitution that would have concentrated the power in the hands of the President and also enabled the seizure of land without compensation. In reaction to that defeat, ZANU-PF began this process of land invasions, releasing war veterans, and youth militias onto the farms to expel commercial farmers and to force their farm workers to flee. The white commercial farmers were not the only victims by any means. It's estimated that up to 200,000 farm workers, and if you include their families, about a million people were also displaced in this violent and chaotic land invasion. A third period of violence occurred in 2005 under Operation Murambatsvina. Again, a Shona word meaning clean out the trash. This was directed at um, traders in the informal sector in the urban areas. Many people believe that it was in retribution for their apparently having voted for the MDC and against ZANU-PF in the 2005 elections. 
the UN sent a special ra rapporteur into Zimbabwe to investigate uh, Operation Marambatsvina, and she concluded that up to 700,000 families had been affected, either by having their um, houses or their businesses um, destroyed, or having been forced to go to the countryside against their will. Finally, I think what we've seen over the 30 years of independence in Zimbabwe is mounting violence at, during every election campaign. Beginning in 1980, but really picking up steam after 2000, when ZANU-PF began to feel embattled by this rising democratic opposition. Just in case you don't know the story, I'll mention what happened in 2008. In March 2008, there was a general election, both presidential and parliamentary. And for the first time ever, the opposition, MDC, which is split into two wings, together won a majority of seats in the National Assembly. So ZANU-PF lost its control over that institution for the first time. So everyone, of course, wanted to see what would happen in the presidential election. They waited with bated breath. And they waited, and they waited. One day passed, two days passed, two weeks passed, ultimately five weeks passed before the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission released the results of that election, of the presidential election. What it showed, what the official results showed, was that Mugabe had won 43% of the vote, and that Morgan Schwangerai, the leader of MDC, had won 48%. The provisions of the Zimbabwean constitution, however, require that in order to win the presidential election, you need an absolute majority on the first round. That is 50% plus one. And because, according to the official results, no one had won an absolute majority, it was necessary to have a second round runoff. <clears throat> now, many people believe that those results were fraudulent and that they were cooked up in that five-week period when an election was being stolen in slow motion. The date for the runoff was set three months later, in June 2008. And between March and June, Zona PF embarked on a reign of terror throughout the country, targeting particularly the activists in the movement for democratic change and their supporters. 200 MDC leaders were killed during that period. <coughs> a couple of hundred thousand were, became displaced people, pushed out of their homes. And Morgan Schwangerai, fearing for his own life, left the country, pulled out of the election, not wanting his followers to be exposed to violence. Mugabe went ahead with the election anyway and announced that he'd won 83% of the vote, thus hanging on to the presidency. Zimbabweans obviously felt that this was not a legitimate election. And more to the point, for the first time, the neighboring countries in the Southern African development community, including countries further afield in the African Union, like Kenya and Senegal, Nigeria, made it clear to Mugabe that they also regarded this election as illegitimate. As a result of that, Mugabe was forced to concede that he would have to enter a power-sharing arrangement with the MDC. It was pushed on them from the outside. Neither party really wanted to do it, but it was the only way out of the standoff. So as a result, Mugabe and Swangarai signed a so-called Global Political Agreement, GPA, in September 2008. And in 2009, February, a coalition government was formed in which Mugabe retained the presidency, but Trangarai was made, made um, prime minister. And it's against that background, and it's under those circumstances, that the study uh, was conducted. Oh yeah, just a few pictures to give you some flavor of this. ZANU-PF's uh, 
uh, symbol is the clenched fist. Morgan Schwangerei's MDC symbol is the open palm. <laughs> Here are some of the MDC supporters at a rally. This cartoon was published in a South African newspaper. You couldn't publish this cartoon inside Zimbabwe. But you'll notice the similarity between the cartoon depiction and the actual depiction. So this is some of the electoral violence that I was talking about. I'm sorry to show these pictures to you, but I want to give you a sense of the utter brutality that's involved here. Ultimately, as I said, 200 MDC officials di either disappeared never to be seen again or their bodies were later found. Okay, so going back to the framework here, is there a transition in Zimbabwe? I say yes, that a transition has started. And for those of you who are interested in transition theory, we could talk about criteria for transitions. Um, I, th I think the very fact that the hegemony of the old regime is broken, and the fact that it needed to enter a power-sharing pact, indicates that some kind of political change is underway. The problem is we don't know what the outcome is going to be. We don't know whether it will be a democratic transition, a transition to some quasi-competitive um, uh, 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 system, or whether we'll see a reversion to party authoritarianism or possibly even a military coup. All of those things are possible. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the old certainties have been disturbed and we're now in a period of transition even though it has an uncertain outcome and in fact may be quite protracted. But I think we can begin to think about transitional justice. The point I made, began to make a little earlier is it seems to me that the most important question about transitional justice is who decides. Is this something that comes out in an elite pact, perhaps negotiated behind closed doors, or is it something in which popular voices are included in a determination of what to do about what Huntington calls the torturer problem? One of the things that has been helpful in the power sharing agreement is it's allowed the issue of transitional justice to surface into public debate. So for example, there is a constitutional reform process going on in which um, public hearings have enabled people to talk about their um, preferences and demands for basic rights. In addition, the power sharing government has established a so-called organ for national healing, reconciliation, and integration who, that ostensibly um, is intended to try to bring a permanent end to the violence and to, uh, to reconcile deeply polarized political opponents. Many in civil society, including the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, the Counseling Services Unit, uh, uh, unit um, the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, the list is very long. Many of the civil, civil society actors feel, however, that the national organ is largely a smokescreen and is attempting to divert attention from um, transitional justice by moving prematurely to a requirement that Zimbabweans reconcile with one another and that the nation be healed without actually addressing what the sources of injustice have been. We conducted um, a national probability sample survey some six months after the coalition government was installed. So in September 2009, um, I worked with the Mass Public Opinion Institute in Harare. We drew a nationally representative sample of 1,200 respondents. We talked to adults of voting age and we ensured that there was an equal representation of men and women. In order to ensure that there was proportional representation of different ethnic and cultural groups too, 
we used the random selection method with a multi-stage stratified sample with probability proportional to population size in each province, district, and locality. Locality being a census enumeration area. With 1,200 respondents, we have a margin of sampling error of plus or minus 3% at a 95% confidence level. So the figures I'm going to show you um, are figures represent a mean around which there's plus or minus 3% sampling error. The surveys employed face-to-face -face interviews in the language of the respondent's choice, either Sindabele or Shoshona or English. And remarkably, and as a signal, I think, that the uh, coalition government had brought a measure of peace, we were able to conduct the survey throughout the country without any logistical or political disturbances. I hope the print is large enough for everyone to read. Basically, what we're interested in understanding, in the first instance, whether there is popular support for a retributive form of transitional justice. And what we did was to pose some questions, and we always in the Afrobarometer like to pose them as alternatives and ask people to tell us which of these two alternatives is closest to their opinion. We find this approach to be more reliable than a Likert scale that just asks people um, to indicate how much they agree with the single statement. Because you get a lot of acquiescence response bias if you do it that way. So we give people two alternatives and they can say either one. So the first one has to do with this contrast between telling the truth or forgetting the past. So we ask them to say whether they think revealing the truth about what happened in the past is necessary in order for Zimbabwe to move forward or in order for our country to make progress, it would be best to forget what happened in the past. And as you can see, a small but noticeable difference, and certainly outside the margin of sampling error, a small majority uh, does feel that it's better to reveal the truth than to forget what happened. So they tend to agree more with Alice than with, with Beatrice. The second question asks about whether perpetrators should be put on trial for their crimes or whether they should be provided with amnesty. In this case, a much clearer majority came out in which twice as many people felt that a measure of retributive justice, a public trial, would be justified. On item C, what we're asking people to compare here uh, really is who should be prosecuted. Should it be every person who was involved in political violence, including the very low-level functionaries who had stabbed those burning cigarettes in the back of the guy that you saw? Or should it just be the people at the very top who had given the orders? And again, people told us, again, very clearly, I think, that they thought everyone who had been involved in the violence should be held to account. In question D, we tried to get directly at this choice between um, retributive justice and restorative justice by asking people whether they preferred um, to have prosecutions or compensation. And it's very interesting to see that Zimbabweans are quite divided on this subject, that equal proportions uh, would be happy with compensation of victims um, as with prosecution of perpetrators. We push a little bit further on question E, asking whether um, apologies would be enough. You know, should they have to confess or compared to truth-telling is not enough, there must be means to punish. And here it became pretty clear that you know, while apologies might be welcome, it was felt that apologies didn't go far enough and that there ought to be uh, legal uh, consequences. Finally, and we were really trying to push the, uh, um, the depth of commitment to re retributive justice here by asking the following question posing the following alternatives. Number one, if the perpetrators of political abuses in Zimbabwe fear pr a criminal prosecution, they will never surrender power. Let's remember we're in the middle of a transition. If transitional justice comes onto the agenda too early, 
it might cause those who are in power just to become more resistant about ever giving up. So we asked people if they, if they thought that was the case, as opposed to seeing that the only way to achieve a lasting political peace in Zimbabwe is to offer amnesty to perpetrators of past abuses. So what you can see here is that even if there is a risk, people still prefer to prosecute rather than grant amnesty. But what you'll notice is that the sum total of responses there adds up to only 75%. About a quarter of the people we talked to found this just to be too difficult a choice to make, and they said, don't know, or we can't decide under those circumstances. OK, so much for that. I'm going to begin to move now from the notion of retributive justice to asking how can we explain it? How can we explain who supports retributive justice? And I'm going to propose a number of predictors or independent variables, a, num a number of possible interpretations of uh, why certain people choose uh, to associate themselves with holding torturers accountable. And the first issue has to do with people's attitudes uh, to peace and justice. And these um, figures here simply show how ordinary Zimbabweans conceptualize these core concepts. And I'm not going to say much about it, except to, to say, if you look at the very bottom um, row, that whereas almost everyone can conceptualize what they mean by peace, about a fifth of the population really doesn't have a well-formed conception of what justice uh, would mean to them. So we approach this in a slightly different way by asking people to prioritize their political values, including transitional justice. So we ask them, and look at the question at the bottom, which says, in thinking about a desirable future for Zimbabwe, what's your, what are your priorities among the following? A peaceful country without political violence? A prosperous economy with improved living standards? Or a healed nation in which the victims of political violence receive justice? Transitional justice is obviously the third um, option. These data show quite clearly is that people pri prioritize peace and prosperity ahead of justice. And that leads us to one of our first hypotheses, which is one's attitude to peace determines your willingness to support measures of transitional justice. That if you're firmly committed to peace at any cost, you may be willing to sacrifice justice in order to get peace. So here are the four hypotheses that we're going to test. And the first one is the one that I've just mentioned. Individuals who value peace above justice are less likely to call for justice. The second hypothesis is, and it's a fairly obvious one, is that those guys with the broken arms that you saw are more likely to support retributive justice. That if you're a direct victim of political violence, you're more likely to want to see um, some kind of um, uh, retribution. The third hypothesis is people who express political fear are less likely to say that they want justice. If they're afraid to express their political opinions, they're going to tell you that, well, transitional justice isn't that important to me. And then finally, the last hypothesis is that partisans of the democratic opposition are more likely than the supporters of the former ruling party to want justice. So MDC supporters are going to want it. Zona PF supporters are less likely to do so. Just to explore some of the explanatory factors here, this looks at the data on victimization. We asked people, looking at the question at the bottom, to think of the period since independence in 1980 and say whether they personally or whether members of their family, family were ever affected in any of the ways listed there. And I think it's rather shocking to see how widespread the reports of um, victimization at the hands of political um, uh, 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 perpetrators are, abusers are. I mean, more than half of 
the adults we interviewed in a nationally representative sample said that they had experienced some intimidation, threat, or harassment. 38% had seen someone else being injured or killed. 20 a quarter had uh, been <coughs> suffered a denial of food or starvation. Going right down to the bottom, in which 13% actually indicated that a member of their family had been killed. Now, there may be some inflation in these figures. There may be people are defining their family quite broadly. But nevertheless, even if the, if the figures were cut in half, they would still be shocking, I would argue. But what it does give us is some way to distinguish people who see themselves as victims from those who don't, enabling us to test that hypothesis of whether victims are more or less likely to support justice measures. This is the way we measured political fear. We asked, in this country, how often do people have to be careful what they say about politics? How often do they have to fear political intimidation as they go about their daily lives? Or fear the same during election campaigns? And what's very clear is that the, the largest set of responses was that they always had to fear these, these outcomes. In fact, the Afrobarometer, we asked these questions in the Afrobarometer across 20 countries, and the levels of political fear are higher in Zimbabwe than in any other country on the continent. So again, we have a good measure to test that hypothesis about the kinds of effects that fear has on attitudes to justice. And then finally, this is the way we measured political partisanship. We asked people, look at the question at the bottom, if a presidential election were held tomorrow, which party's candidate would you vote for? So this is in September 2009, and if anyone's interested, I can talk about what's happened since then. But at that time, 55% said they would vote for Trangarai's MDC. Only 11% said they would vote for Zanu PF. Um, and Mutambara's MDC basically uh, was uh, facing uh, electoral obliteration in that very few people um, were willing to say that they supported it. So really what we have in Zimbabwe is a two-party system um, between the top two that are listed there. And uh, we scored anyone who was not a Zona PF supporter as being a supporter of the, the democratic opposition. Okay, so these are the results that we got from the analysis. I don't know how familiar this group is with a regression analysis, presumably quite familiar. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'll try and point out um, what, what the figures mean and um, how to read, uh, read the table. As the heading suggests, we're explaining popular support for retributive justice. And we're entering in all of the variables that we think might affect that outcome. The four individual characteristics relate to the four hypotheses that I um, outlined. Whether you were a victim, whether you were an opposition partisan, whether you preferred peace to justice, whether you expressed political fear. But in order to control for other factors that might be affecting support for retributive justice, I also entered some standard demographic controls, education, residence, gender, age, ethnicity. In this case, measured by whether you were a Sindabeli speaker. Sindabeli speakers are in Matabililand, north and south, and in the town of Bulawayo. And we also put in the administrative uh, province scored as a means of seeing whether there were regional effects. And there's something I want to say at the end about regional effects. In order to read the results, we can ignore for all practical purposes the standard error column. And we can look initially at the relationships that are significant, and we see that there are five of them, and they're bolded. That is, wherever there is a significance level above at above point 0.1, which is a fairly relaxed level, but you'll see that for the individual characteristics, they're all highly significant. So we know there's something going on here. And we can also look at the beta column, which um, 
is a standardized regression coefficient that shows us the relative weight of each of these explanatory factors in explaining the um, outcome of interest. So basically what it shows is that the most important factor, looking at the beta column, the most important factor in explaining re support for retributive justice is whether one was a victim of uh, political violence. But almost equally as important is whether one is an opposition partisan. Zimbabwean politics are so polarized that one's political identity really determines one's outlook on a whole range of political, economic, and developmental issues, including transitional justice. Both of these um, relationships run in the direction we predicted, that victims and opposition partisans are more likely to support retributive justice. There's an unspoken plus sign before each of those coefficients. When we come to the preference of peace above justice, however, we see a negative sign. But again, this is consistent with what we expected. We expected that if people said, we'd rather have peace than justice, that the most important, in our priority of values, peace is the most important thing, they would be less likely to require justice. And in fact, that's what we find. In terms of political fear, our hypothesis was not borne out. Because you remember what I said. The way we set it up was on the assumption that if you were fearful, you'd be less likely to say you wanted justice. But in fact, what we find is the more fearful you are, the more likely you are to want justice. And it's a significant relationship. What that tells us, I think, is, is actually quite encouraging. That while Zimbabweans may feel fearful, they have not lost their voice. They're still willing to demand justice. That they're not so fearful that they censor themselves and pull back from any um, involvement in calling for accountability. The only demographic factor that mattered was education. The more educated people were, the more likely they were to, su to support retributive justice probably because they understood the institutional mechanisms that were um, available for holding abusers accountable. Let me make a, just for a, a minute or so, a slight detour to talk about the kinds of measures that people would like to see. Understanding that there's a willingness to countenance legal prosecution of abusers, we asked people to say, in what kinds of courts of law would they like to see these abusers tried? Would it be the International Criminal Court in The Hague? Or would it be national courts in Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe? Or would it be community courts, perhaps on the model of Gachacha in Rwanda, in which either councils of elders or, or councils of citizens sat in judgment over their peers? Going into the research, I thought Zimbabweans would be like Rwandans and that they would say we want a some kind of traditional court to judge these abusers. In fact, they didn't say that at all. Only 5% opted for traditional courts. 25% opted for sending the abusers to The Hague, but almost half, 47%, opted for the use of the national courts. And I'd be very interested in Professor Ndulo's reaction to that because what it's saying to me is that there's an extraordinary level of um, remaining trust in the national judicial system in Zimbabwe, more than I would have expected given what we know about Mugabe's politicization of the upper courts, particularly the supreme and high courts. Nevertheless, the Zimbabwe lawyers for human rights, many of their clients still seem to believe that you can get justice in the Zimbabwean courts. And what this research has uh, exposed is that many Zimbabwean citizens think that as well. The last thing I'd like to talk about is what I call the Matabeleland puzzle. Remember that the largest set of events 
of a politically violent nature in Zimbabwe were in Matabele land in the 1980s, so-called Gukuru Hundi, the events that I referred to as a possible genocide. One might expect that the residents of Matabele land and the speakers of the Sindabeli language used as a measure of ethnicity would be more likely than the average Zimbabwe to, to Zimbabwean to demand translational justice. But that's not what the data show us. If you look at ethnicity, Sindabeli speaker, the relationship's not significant, but the sign is not what you would expect. That negative sign means that they lean less likely. The first thing I can, should say is there's no statistical difference between Sindabeli speakers and others, but if they lean anyway, they lean against retributive justice. And the same goes for the residents of Bulawayo and Matabili Land South. And this seems to fly in the face of reasonable um, expectations. Perhaps people in answering these questions were thinking about the most recent round of violence, you know, around the 2008 election, rather than about Gukuru Hundi in the 1980s. That's one possible explanation. But we know, we know from conversations with people from the Matabili Land region that a, a historical memory of Gukuru Hundi um, persists. As a way of trying to resolve the Matabili Land puzzle, we convened a series of focus groups, and you saw a quotation at the beginning uh, from that. And I also did some interviews with NGO leaders who work in Matabili Land to try and understand, well, what's going on here? And from these interviews, they suggested three, three possible um, explanations. And let me just run through them and tell you the one that we settled on and what it tells us about the prospects for a lasting political peace in Zimbabwe. The first explanation was had to do with generation. We were told perhaps it's the older people who are actually alive at the time of Gukuru Hundi who want retributive justice, but the younger people who didn't experience it, experience it feel less you know, committed on, the, on this issue. But when we tested the data, we found a strong negative bivariate relationship between age and this kind of justice. And that that relationship was even stronger in Matabili land than it was in the rest of the country. So in other words, older people in Matabili land were especially unlikely to call for legal redress. The second ex explanation that was suggested to us was that people in Matabili land might be particularly afraid to express their true opinions to a survey researcher uh, who they don't know. In other words, while secretly they want to vigorously pursue justice, they pretend otherwise to the interviewer. But again, what we found was that fewer Matabili land residents expressed fear than the rest of the country, and we reached the conclusion that fear seemed to play a smaller role in Matabili land than elsewhere um, in the country. Remember that the bivariate association between political fear and preference to pursue retribution was positive in Zimbabwe as a whole, and this association was even stronger within, within Matabili land. So fear could not be suppressing demand for this kind of justice. So thirdly and finally, the people of Matabili land may calculate that until there's a democratic transition, plus a change of national leadership, they will never obtain justice. Rather, by raising the subject prematurely, they might invite further collective punishment as a minority ethnic group. In this interpretation, people are neither forgetting the past nor censoring their answers. Instead, they arrive at a rational conclusion to let sleeping dogs lie. In other words, it's simply not worth demanding justice, especially a retributive form, if the likely consequence is that as a marginalized minority, they will be ignored or, at worst, visited again with the heavy hand of state coercion. One thing that I'll add to this is that we noted that ethnic identities were especially high in this region. The survey asked respondents to choose whether they define themselves more in terms of their ethnic group or their nationality. In Matabili land, people were three times more likely than other Zimbabweans to put their ethnic group for example, Ndebele or Kalanga or Fenda or Tonga, uh, 
above their national identity. Outside Bulawayo, the main urban center in the region, almost half, 48% of all respondents in the two rural provinces uh, said that they saw themselves mainly in terms of their ethnic group. In this region too, people saw their ethnic group's condition as worse than other groups in Zimbabwe, 37 versus uh, 16%, and that their ethnic group had less political influence than other groups, 61% versus 24%. So it's my conclusion in trying to solve the Matabili land puzzle that it's this final set of considerations uh, that matters. The elite interviews and the focus group discussions bear out the interpretation that ethnic minorities lack confidence that justice can be obtained under the current power structure. A focus group discussant in Bulawayo gave the opinion that, quote, as long as Mugabe is there, they, the perpetrators, will be sentenced today and tomorrow he will pronounce an amnesty and they'll be free again. And an NGO leader confirmed that power sharing among political elites was not an adequate solution because he said, even under the so-called inclusive government, we in Matabililand feel exposed without a protector. So, reflecting deep-seated social divisions, another said, the people of Matabililand have never felt part of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe made, made, uh, Mugabe made it very tribal. People were killed because they couldn't speak Shona. Now they don't believe that a Shona-dominated government, even one headed by Morgan Shangarai, will ever help them. They feel like orphans or stepchildren. One last thought. The relationship between peace and justice and any possible trade-off between them should therefore be seen within the context of time. In the short run, people will quite reasonably, reasonably prefer to put an end to ongoing violence, even if this means putting justice on a back burner. But over the longer term, and once political conditions allow, there has to be a change in political circumstances. They are likely to acknowledge that a permanent peace is impossible without close attention to justice. Let me stop there. If some people were in the opposition for certain things, but not for, were in the, perp um, the perpetrators for right. other things, then that also, it seems to me, would uh, make it very difficult to separate out the effects of who might be upset yes. by the way they answer those questions. The overwhelming proportion of atrocities has been conducted, ha have been state-sponsored, that is conducted by agencies of the ruling political party or its auxiliary, auxiliaries, or its state agents. <coughs> However, in 2008, during the presidential runoff, there was violence not only in Matabililand, in fact, far less in Matabililand in 2008, than in the swing constituencies that had gone over to MDC. So in that sense, there is some contamination. And that's why I said perhaps people would think in their answers, they, in trying to solve the Matabililand puzzle, perhaps people, including those in the Northeast, were thinking about the most recent 2008 atrocities and not about Gukuru Hundi that had happened 30 years earlier. The findings on the judges I find yeah. intriguing. Me too. Yeah defies the facts in the sense that uh, first, you know, I don't know those who don't know the history about the judiciary there, is that actually, I mean, there are no so-called, uh, you know, veterans overrun the courts and chased the judges, I mean, they assaulted the chief justice and they had to flee, you know. So, and then the, uh, the guy who delayed the election for one month, Chueshe, mm -hmm. was rewarded by being made judge president. <laughs> And this is the court. So I mean, this is. And then the final fact is that, the, except for one judge, Sandura, all the judges got gifts of land from the government. Farms, yeah. And they accepted that. So I, I don't see how you trust that kind of uh, yeah. uh, judiciary. It's kind of like really interesting. It, it uh, does remain a puzzle. As I said, I predicted that people would want community courts, but apparently, 
they see the chiefs as being even more corrupted <laughs> than the judges. Yeah. And but perhaps it's a lack of information, uh, particularly among rural people, as to the extent to which the courts have been corrupted. <laughs> Having said that, uh, the courts are not entirely corrupted, oh, yeah. particularly at the magistrate's oh, level yeah. and among certain high, high court judges who are trying to uphold the rule of law. Yeah. I mean, otherwise the Zimbabwe lawyers for human rights wouldn't find it worthwhile to try and pursue cases when some of their clients are wrong, wrongfully prosecuted. Mm -hmm. They can get judgments from some the judges. The ones, yeah. yeah. Or internal versus external information expenditure. Sometimes we know more outside than, than people inside do of the media's control. The media are largely state controlled in Zimbabwe. <coughs> Radio, television are government monopolies. The two main daily newspapers are government controlled. There is an independent press, including now, in the last year, independent dailies. But the fact is they don't, uh, their um, scope doesn't radiate very far beyond the capital cities. And because of the price of newspapers in a country that's in an economic crisis, most people can't even afford to buy them. But the real challenge, of course, is in a tightly controlled media environment where the radio and television are literally spewing hate speech and where most foreign co correspondents are kept out of the country and where community radio is banned, exactly how do you improve the information dissemination environment? It has to be done quietly, and in, with small initiatives. And, you know, there are many civil society uh, actors who are trying to address that very question. With the greater than 70 year history of whites attacking blacks in Zimbabwe, for instance, whites drove blacks into caves and lit dynamite, as you may know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that cast. But, so what, but the violence died cast by those long years of operation in contrast to 30 years after 19. And in fact, that's why I tried to point out that there was a very long history of violence in this country. Some of the techniques that ZANU-PF uses today and some of the laws that ZANU-PF uses today were first designed during the colonial period. Something we haven't talked at all about um, here is the fact that over time, especially since 2000, the regime in Zimbabwe has become highly militarized with senior secu security chiefs making basic political decisions. Some say even forcing Mugabe to stay in power when he was considering resigning after the first round of the 2008 elections. So we've got a quasi-military regime here. Most policy is made in a, an organization called the Joint Operations Command, which is like the Joint Chiefs of State. The JOC was first designed by the Rhodesians during the Liberation War as a counterinsurgency tool. It's now being used by the Mugabe regime as an instrument to repress the democratic opposition. So yes, I believe if you want to really understand this situation, you need to understand the historical and institutional roots of it. Thank you very much.